Morning, everyone. Welcome to Lecture 9. Um, announcements for once. I can start out not talking about admin all the time. Um, uh, these will be on the slides. Please read Python Playground, an open notebook populated with course data for you to mess around with before you do your homework. As a general rule, we do not expect you to go to lecture and then when you receive the homework, just start doing the homework. We expect you to have gone through the textbook, hit the interact button, run the code. And now we would love it if you would please, even if you start with the homework problems, start with them on your uh, blank notebook, mess around, and uh, then, try, then try the homework. What I'm seeing uh, is most people are doing that. Um, and then uh, some people are expecting that they're going to be able to go to the lectures, watch code, and then do the homework without ever having done any intervening practice. That doesn't work, because what's happening is the, the amount of detail is growing. So please take that little time to go through the lectures. Uh, I would suggest going through the textbook, because you can make those notebooks come alive, um, and uh, then trying a few things out before you go to homework. So, what I do in lectures is very similar to what's in the book. When I do something quite different, I will post it. There's only one such that I've posted. Um, so today, what I'd like to do is to beg you, please, please, please fill out the welcome survey and a huge thank you to the 345 last night out of 500-something people who have already filled this out. Uh, that's a very fast turnaround, and I really appreciate it. Please do it. Um, let me, uh, to inspire you to get your contribution, let me tell you what the, a bit of what the responses look like so far. So there's a question of, does this course fulfill, currently fulfill a requirement for one of your intended degree programs? No, is the almost two-thirds of the students. And uh, so uh, I would like to thank you. You are here not because somebody is making you, but because you are here because, well, you chose to be here. And I am very grateful for that. Thank you very much. Um, and now, another one. So there is a common experience that I found for people who uh, haven't come in with any kind of programming uh, background to think that when you're going to lab, everybody else around you knows exactly what they're doing. And you're the only one who doesn't know what they're doing, and so you shouldn't be asking questions and you feel stupid. So there's a question that says, you know, how, how good of a programmer are you? Uh, here are the answers. That's what, 345 out of 500 something. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is take a look at this top half. This pale blue is this pale blue here. I have no skill at programming, right there. This green is a bad programmer, right there. And this purple is a terrible programmer. <laughs> Fully half the class considers that they have either no skill or that they are bad or that they're terrible. <laughs> right. So it is not the case that everybody else around you knows exactly what they're doing. Even the people who feel that they know something, so here, a reasonable programmer. Okay, I mean, they're not going overboard. Okay. A reasonable programmer. Uh, uh, about 8% say that they're good. 10% say they don't know. That's a, an answer that I understand. We're asking, are you a good programmer? I think a natural question is relative to what? The people at Google? <laughs> I don't know. So I understand the I don't know. But you can see the majority of the people are really quite uncertain. Uh, and so you should not feel alone by any means if you are among them. I will say to this purple crowd, the I am a terrible programmer, that crowd, maybe you don't need to be quite so hard on yourself. I mean, you're probably better than you think. Okay. Um, so, um, I implore you to please fill this out. Why? First, I would love to know who you are so that we could, the course can serve you better. One of the advantages of being in a course at its early stages of development is that we can respond in real time to uh, our audience. Uh, we're not so ingrained in this is the way data aid is taught that it can't change. That's one. The other is that your responses are going to be extremely useful for developing the entire data science education program. A number of you have written to me saying, you know, what comes after this? 
or how can I use this method, these methods in my work, in my department, and so on. All of that needs you know, a coordinated effort from the entire campus. And that's called the Data Science Education Program. And they, in particular, have a report that's due imminently. And what we're trying to do is to give them a sense of the progress of this course across the three semesters that it's been taught. And the population is unrecognizable from when I taught it this time last year. Um, so uh, we need your responses. And I'm about to say something. Uh, well, hang on. So uh, there is Vinitra sends all these emails around with these wonderful cartoons, which I love. Um, asking you to please, please, please fill out the survey. And she sent out something about a point extra credit. Yes? Somebody remind me? Yes, one bonus point for doing what? For turning in the survey, yes? Yes, before I think it was Monday. Yeah? Something like that. Okay, so what I'm about to say now isn't on the slide because I just made it up. Um, it's important to us to get your responses early. And so we have 3.45 as of last night. If by tomorrow evening, say about 8 o'clock tomorrow evening, that's Thursday, yes, labs are done, homework's been turned in, and so on. If by tomorrow evening we have 475 or more responses, got the number? 475 or more by about 8 p.m. tomorrow, then I personally will give all respondents not one but two points of extra credit. It's a big percent of the class. I'm asking for a lot. It might not happen. But if you haven't done it, do it. And if you know people who haven't done it, bug them. Because this is free points for what takes not long. Right? Those who have done it know. All right? So please do this. This is important to us. Your voice needs to be heard. A faculty by themselves can't develop an educational program. So please do it. So I will codify this and post it on Piazza so that it's true uh, and everybody understands. It is still true that if you submit by whatever date Vinitra said, you will get one point. But try, try, try. Giving me a massive response rate by tomorrow. Thank you. I appreciate it. And so does the entire program. All right. So here's what I'd like to do. Today's lecture, I would like to take the first half to develop a basic method. And then in the second half, I'd like to do a mini project. Right? I want to use what we have developed thus far to do something that has some real power. And uh, the topic of the day is defining functions. Now, we've used functions all the time. Abs, sum, round, uh, array functions, np dot round, um, and so on. Lots and lots of functions. Um, and those are functions that exist in Python. Frequently in an analysis, you want to do something over and over again for which Python doesn't have a function. You get to write your own, right? And that's very handy for uh, making your work easy uh, or easier uh, when you are doing an analysis. So you get to write your own functions, and it's useful when you want to do the same repeated computation that doesn't already exist in, um, in Python. So uh, the way to start this is to just do it. So we will define functions. And so import, OK. A function definition starts with a def statement. Define. I am going to define a function called double. This function double will take one argument, x. OK, now, you can please, when you write your notes, make a note. I called it x, my choice. You can call it anything you wish. It doesn't have anything to do with what went before or what came after. OK, crucial element, colon. That says, define the function called double. That takes one single argument. When I hit return, it already indents four places. Def expects an indentation. The indentation will be done for you. Now we start what is called the body of the statement. The body of the statement is what you ask the function to do. And so what I'm going to ask the function to do is, how about that? That looked like a double? 2 times x. And then I'm going to ask it to compute that value. And then I am going to ask it to, re if I can spell, return that value. So 
So whatever number we give it, we call double of mm, it will cal calculate twice mm and give it back to us. Uh, and so if you define this statement like this, then you run and what you've got is apparently nothing's happened, but the statement has been defined. And now if we call double with, uh, oh, how about 17.1, Right? Is that what you expect? That's what you expect. So we could do, uh, well, actually, so. You can have a name. You can do, uh, and so on. It's just an ordinary function. Uh, you work with it just as you work with every other function, and uh, uh, the only thing is that you got to define it. Um, now, it's a very straightforward function, but uh, it is important at this point to know the different bits. And I will pause for a second and make one observation. This x right here, has an existence unlike any other that you have thus far seen. It actually doesn't have an existence outside the body of the function. Nobody else gets to refer to that name x. So for example, if I say x right here and ask for what that is, uh, there is a little bit of unhappiness. It is basically a whatchamacallit that sits inside the function, and only the body of the function can call that. And this normally does not affect you. Just be aware that that is a name. It's what in mathematics is called a dummy variable, right? And it's only understood by the, uh, the function. Yes? Right? But I implore you not to do that, actually, because now you know, when you read your notebook, you're going to get all confused. So I, I, try, I try to not use the same name for two things, even for dummy variables. But that's just that, that x inside the body of the function is different. And honestly, I wish that function definition cells could have a different color so that you could recognize that there was something internal going on. Uh, but they don't. Uh, I think you can, uh, as, you, uh, as we go through, you'll get used to this. So what am I doing here? I don't want that. Uh, I want that to go away. I want that. Okay. So we've done def statements, user-defined functions to give names to blocks of code. In other words, you can define your functions. All right, so here we go. There is a function that has been defined. The function's name is spread. The arguments are uh, values. Now, you could have more than one argument. You would separate them by commas, right? X, comma, Y, comma, Z, depending on how complicated the function is that you're trying to write. Um, that there is the body of the statement. It's what you're asking the function to do. Um, and the expression that you are asking to be calculated is what is called the return expression. Now, we rarely actually use that much technical jargon, but however, as we define functions, we will be using this language, and it should just, you know, it, uh, you should get used to it and recognize what the different bits are. Um, why don't we do another one? So, um, How about I try to convert x as a percent of y, so x relative to y times 100, um, and you know that could give us awful 
long decimal places and we don't like those. So how about we round and then we ask for that to be returned. Does that seem like a reasonable function to convert one number to a percent out of the other? Seems okay? All right. The thing that is often forgotten is the colon. Please remember the colon. That tells you where that def line completes. Okay, okay so uh, I do that, and then if we do def, uh, uh, sorry, percent, um, what should we do? Eight out of uh, 40, then what do we get? We get 20%. Eight is one fifth of 40, that is 20%. We've defined a function correctly. All okay? So here's a function which takes two arguments, no big deal. Um, okay, so here's uh, another function that looks very similar. Uh, what I'd like you to do is talk to your uh, talk to your neighbor, figure out what the function does, what it, does it act on, what's its input, what kind of output does it give you, and you know I've been using x, y, and so on. Nobody understands what those mean. One week later, so what name should we give it? There we go. Talk to your neighbor, please. Right, so I have a sub-question for you. Is this the same function as the one we just defined, or is it different? Mm, that part in the room now. All right, so what we'll do is we will take this line by line. The first question is, what does this function do? Well, you know what, that's the last thing you figure out. Uh, what kind of input does it take? So if I look here... I have no idea, because this thing, in my mind, I just read that as Josephine. I have no idea what that is. So I cannot answer that question yet. So now I start looking at what the body says, and the body says return something, right? Fine, so it's going to return something, and this kind of looks like an expression to me. Okay, so now we start looking at that expression, and what do you see here? NP, no, 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 you see NP first. Yes? When you see NP, what, is, what, what does your head go to? Or what it should go to? Array. Arrays. Type. Type. This thing is going to operate on an array. Right? NP dot round better be working on an array, so that stuff inside here better be uh, an array. This is just the two decimal places. Okay. So now we examine this closely. That better be an array. All right. Is this consistent with saying that S better be an array? Some S, will that work if S is an array? It will work. What will it calculate? The total of all the elements in the array, right? So that is a useful thing to calculate. If you've got an array, you calculate the total. Then what does this expression do? S divided by the sum of S? Each element of the array gets divided by the total. Yeah? 
So every element of the array now gets converted to a decimal value, a fraction. The multiplication by 100 converts to our familiar percent scale. Okay. So now we have all what we need to go back and answer the questions. What does the function do? It... Okay, so, so, okay, I'm trying not to have a private conversation with you. <laughs> so raise your hand, please, thank you. All right, so, yes, so the function returns something, right? Uh, if you try to explain to somebody who doesn't understand Python uh, language, could you say, in, just in terms of calculation, what, is, what it is doing? It is, when we say you, you, when you create percents, we say you convert something to percents, Yes? What is it converting to percent? I'm sorry? L, okay, terrific. It's com uh, converting all the elements of S to percents. And then rounding those to two decimal places. That's sort of, you know, so the, there's a list of numbers. It's converting the uh, uh, elements in that list of numbers to percents relative to the total in the list and giving you the answer back correct to two decimal places. That's kind of what it's doing. What kind of input does it take all together now? Array. An array, terrific. What kind of output does it give? Array. An array, because it's doing the same thing to each element of your array. What's a reasonable name? Not Josephine, so, yes. Round array? Round array is good, uh, sorry? Array. Percent array is good. Right, so that says you convert an array to percents, sure. Why don't we, you can think of other names as well, but why don't we go with percent array? Um, and so we have def. Uh, and when I write definitions, just to remind myself of what it's taking, I usually don't just say S, I just say what the thing is. And so what we had said was it's gonna return uh, the array relative to the sum of the array and that thing rounded to two decimal places. Is that looking good to you? Times 100. So uh, thank you. So I will multiply that. Multiplication you can do in any order. However, I just like my parentheses around there. Um, and so if we define uh, how many values do I have there? 22? Yes? All right, so we do that, and then we do percent array. Actually, why don't I do three here so that we know what the answer should be. Thirty-five percent, fifty percent, and fifteen percent. That's the total is twenty, so those are correct answers. Yep. And so now, if I mess with this and make it awful. Uh, nobody can divide by 22 in their heads, not many people anyway, then you now had suddenly have some power. And why is this helpful? Because numerous times in past lectures, we've taken those census data, right? Age, you know, there were counts in every age group, and we have converted them to percents, and we have written out that line of code every single time. We don't have to do that now. We can just call our function percent. And that's something that you're gonna to want to do over and over again. Uh, when you have a table, you're gonna to want to transform one of your columns by, uh, by a function. And we already know how to transform columns by functions that take percents as an array. You just call percent of the column. What I would like to do is define another kind of function. Um, uh, and that is something that just takes a number as its array and does something, yes? Uh, if you want to add the percent sign, if you want it to appear with percents, then you would have to use the set formatter, percent formatter thing that we did briefly. I would rather not get into that. If you look at the first time the census data appear in the textbook, there is something that tells you how to do that. Okay. Um, yes? Don't they, don't, don't they 
Oh, here, yeah, you could, you could do, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. A any function that applies to arrays, you could use. The question is, you know, could I use np-sum, np.max, all of those things you can use. Um, there are some issues to do with speed. In this class, we don't get into speed at all. Um, so what I'd like to do is remind you of the, uh, the age classification that we had in the census table was 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 100. And then the age classification of 100 was not just the people who are 100 years old. It was the people who are 100 years old or more. All right, so the, uh, whoever is, is the census tabulator has to go through each person's age and notice, is it 100 or more, right? And if it's less than 100, it leaves it alone, and if it's more than 100, it calls it 100, yeah? So uh, that is a function that I would like to define, and what I'd like you to do is help me define that function. And this is not to do with Python, it's just to do with, uh, you know, what is the calculation that's being done here? So the function is going to break at 100, yes? Good? Any more to put in? It's okay? Fine. So that name has no meaning, right, except to me, right? And I use a name that I will remember. So my problem is if I call every single function, every single argument x, then when I go back, I actually have to look at the code to figure out what it takes. So I try to tell myself what it's taking. So often I will say table name and so on. All right. Um, so, uh, so we're trying to, to get a function that will cut off the ages at 100, and anything beyond 100, it'll say 100. So if the function sees an age of 23, what should it return? Hello? 23. If it sees an age of 123, what should it return? 123. 100. Great. If it sees an age of 100, what should it return? 100. What's the function? Number 100. What is it returning? Write down arbitrary numbers. So write down pairs, right? Your favorite number and 100, and then what it returns. Then another one, your favorite number, a different favorite, your second favorite number and 100, what it returns, and tell me what function it is. Go ahead. It's a known function. So what we did was 23, when it operates on 23 and 100, it returns what? Hello? It operates on 23 and 100, it returns what? Oh, so we have now, okay. This is a code for age. If a person is 23 years old, what did the Census Bureau say it was? They're 23 years old. If the person was 123 years old, what code did the Census use? 100, okay? So this function needs your age, that is, it needs the 23, and it needs where that cutoff is. It needs 100, right? So what I'm asking you is if the function understands that the age is 23 and the cutoff is 100, what is it going to return? It's going to return 23, right? So when it operates on 23 and 100, it returns 23. When it operates on 115 and 100, it returns what? 100. So what's it doing to those two numbers? I'm sorry? It is comparing them and returning which number? Min. Min, thank you. It is the minimum of your, the age that you provide and 100. That is what it is giving you, thank you. It is merely the min function. And it's important to understand that these cutoffs are typically mins or maxes. So now we've got a function that we can define. And I'm gonna call it cutoff at 100, and it's going to take uh, an argument, which uh, I'm just going to call uh, age, and uh, I could call it anything, and this is going to return the min of age and 100. Okay, so now uh, I just want to make sure that this thing works. Cut off at 100 of 23. So far, so good. Cut off at 100, 1,023, 100. Okay? 
and cut off at 100 of 100, it just gives me 100. We're good. Happy? All right. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to pretend I'm the census. I don't just have one number. I have you know, 300 million numbers, one for at the age of every person in the United States, and I'm going to pretend that the United States has just six people in it and that the people are called A through F, and those are their ages. All right, so uh, what I'd love to do is apply this function to that column, yes? But this function, what does it take as its argument? It takes a number. It does not take an array. Hello? Okay, um, it does not take a number. So what I'd like to do is I would like to apply this function to every element of the array. And we do that by a table method called apply. So we will do the table, I called it ages. So ages dot apply. So to the table ages, apply the function. What did we call the function? I kind of lost my shift key here. Cut off at 100, is that what we call it? Yes, that's what we called it. Apply this function to which column? Age, right? Syntax, to this table, apply the, this function to this column, and we will get an array back, which allegedly has applied the function to every element of this column, has it? 17, it returns 17, that's correct. 117, it returned 100, that's correct. 52, 100, so far so good, yes? And so the method apply just applies your function that you have defined on a single element to every element of the column. Very handy. And indeed, you can augment your uh, table by methods that you now know. You can do ages dot width column. Um, what should I call it? How about cut off age? And this. is exactly the array that I computed uh, up there. So ages.apply my function cut off at 100 to the column age. Okay, so I'd like you to please look at that line of code. Is that a familiar line of code apart from the apply? Yes, we've just added a column by creating something new, and the only thing is how we are creating that something new. Uh, and so if I do that and take a look at it. Okay, so that's what the Census Bureau does. Well, not using this method, but something similar. Okay, all right, yes. Yeah. Of course, you could do apply sequence of applies. Well, it depends on what you are applying, right? The next function that you apply, if it takes an array, then you can work on it. Okay. Yes? So it depends on the next function. Right? If the next function takes a table, then you have to first create the table. If the next function just works on array, then you can apply it directly. Okay? All right, so this is now, for me, a pause where we have developed a techniques now that allow us to do something quite interesting. So I am going to go through uh, uh, a project which has to do with uh, Sir Francis Galton, who was um, Charles Darwin's cousin. And uh, I think you know from Darwin's history that uh, there was a lot of uh, interest in how uh, traits are passed down. And uh, Darwin, of course, was interested in all creatures, and uh, Galton was interested particularly in humans. Uh, he is a, a noisome individual in the sense that he was into eugenics, which is breeding Superman. And in fact, the term eugenics, E-U-G-E-N-I-C-S, eugenics was coined by Galton. So I have really no time for him in that respect. However, as a scientist, I tell you what, this guy was fantastic. 
Moreover, hardworking, meticulous data collection analysis by hand. So this is his data set, one of his many data sets. 934 adult children. So you see the child here. These are adults. And he's trying to figure out how height gets passed down from one generation to another. So for each of these adults, he calls them the child, and he notes their height. This is in inches, of course. Okay. Uh, he notes the gender. Uh, he notes uh, the child num is the order in the family, whether the first born, the second born, the third born, the fourth born. He's noting, noting that. The number of children in the family, hold on with this for a second, the mother's height, the father's height. And this is just a code for which family it was. Right? Now, this family had four children, so it appears in four lines of the table. That's why there are four ones. Right? Okay, so uh, one att uh, the attempt that he made uh, is instead of looking at uh, mother's height and father's height separately as predictors of a child's height, he made a combination of uh, the two heights uh, of the parents. And what you would love to see here is the average of these two. He didn't quite do that. He weighted it so that the mother's heights have a slightly higher weight. And there's a big discussion as to whether he should have done it or not. Regardless, what he did was he created one combination of the parents' heights, exactly what he did. And a reference to the discussion is in the textbook. He created a combination of the two parents' heights called mid-parent height. And what he was attempting to do and what we are going to attempt to do in his footsteps is to try to use that number to predict the height of a child which child? Well, of course, these 934 so-called children, we already know their heights. But supposing you have the next family that comes along, then you can measure the heights of the parents. Uh, the child hasn't grown up yet. Can you predict the height of the child? And that's the goal. And so the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to just uh, select just the bits that we want. You've seen me do this many, many times. Just leave out all the fluff and work with a table that just has what I want. And uh, it is interesting, therefore, if I'm trying to use one variable to estimate another, then this certainly becomes a good thing to do. Uh, can somebody remind me what that does? It produces a scatter plot. What's that zero? It's the column label of the horizontal axis, yes, or the column index of the horizontal axis. So which one is the horizontal axis here? Mid-parent height. So conventionally, the thing that you are going to use as your base for prediction is put on the horizontal axis, and the other one's put on the vertical. You can do it the other way. If you wish, you just have to turn all my graphs around and uh, risk being called weird. OK. So that's what the scatter diagram looks like. And our job is somebody is going to, there's going to be a new couple. We're going to measure their mid-parent height, and then we have to predict the height of their child. So supposing we have this new couple, we take their mid-parent height, and it turns out to be 68. Right there. Then can you suggest some reasonable points to look at on the graph, and some points that perhaps we don't have to pay so much attention to? What should we be looking at in the graph? So I'm hearing a lot of mumbles, so around 68. Yep. Because the people, the, the, the parents are closest to these people just here. You agree? They are not like these people, and they are not like these people. They are closest to these people right here. And these are the heights of the children of parents like them. So it is natural to say, well, you know what? I look at these children only. I'll forget that I have the rest of the scatter diagram. I look at these children only and pick off kind of their average height, which is about there. Does that seem like a plan? So in general, the idea is you have this new individual. Find the individuals that you already had that are like them. And then compute sort of roughly an average of their outcome and use that as your prediction. That is a very general a method that started with this. And so I have a picture here, and you can please ignore the code because there's a lot of line drawing going on that shows you what we have intended to do. The mid-parent height of this new family is at 68. We've taken a strip around it. We get to define what around means. Okay. Now, obviously, different definitions of around will create different estimates. But for now, 
uh, we're not going to worry about that. We're just going to use some reasonable definition of around. And we look only at the points that are in that strip, and then we take the average of the strip, and that's my gold dot right here. OK? So now there's the question of how do we actually do this? So we have a table called heights. From that table, we have to extract which rows. Well, the rows for which the mid-parent height is in this range. Yep. So for this, I need to tell you what I took as that range. So I just define close to be, just for no particular reason, within half an inch. Right? It's up to me to de define. And you have the code in the textbook. You can change that and see how the prediction changes. Right? So within half an inch. In other words, I want the, uh, the points where the mid-parent height is between what and what? 67.5 and 68.5. So what am I going to use? Careful. I'm going to select, select. No, I'm not going to select works on what? Columns. I want the individual, so I want the people, right? So I want what? I want rows. I want a row operator. I want where? Yep. And so let's see what we get. Um, so I'll call this close to 68 is, OK, heights uh, dot where. Oh, what did I call it? Mid-parent with capital P, OK. Um, mid, I could have used zero there, but uh, nobody will remember what I'm doing later. So, yep. What will this return? A new table. That is what it will return, where all the rows. These numbers are all between 67 and a half and 68 and a half. That's what it's done. And so now my prediction is going to be what? These are the rows corresponding to these points right here. And so what do I want to do to this? Now I want to make a prediction. I'm predicting child's height, so I will look at this column and do what to it? I'll take an average. OK, so I will extract that column close to 68. Um, where am I? A dot column. Oh. Child, and then I think that's going to work. There you go. All right? OK, so what we have estimating is that this height, the predicted child height is 66 and a quarter, roughly. Does that look right? So 68, I go up here. There's 65. There's 70. There's 5 in here. Yeah, 66 and a bit. Looking good. Looking good. OK? And so now, because uh, we know how to define functions, what we can do is we can create a function that just does this prediction for different values of the given mid-parent height. If we can do it for 68, then we can do it for 72. Well, let's do it for 72. Uh, well, OK, so to do it for 72, I will have to run the code again. What I'm going to do is here is how I often define functions. Collect. The code that is needed. OK, so now I'm going to start defining a function. And I'm going to call it define predict child. And it's going to take a number that is the mid-parent height. And I remind myself that that's what, that's what it's going to take. OK? I'm worried. My entire classroom can turn around behind me. I wouldn't know. OK. Um, OK, so height dot where mid-parent height are between what and what? MPHT, the name of my thing, minus 0 0.5. And the other end, 
plus 0 0.5. So wherever I had uh, 68, I'm replacing by the generic. And uh, uh, let me call that close without the 68. Uh, and that's what I want returned. Do you agree? I'm going to pause. Yes? Correct function? Questions about the function? I've simply copied over. Yes? So we define this function, and what I'd like to do is run the function on something. This is what I always do. Run the function on something for which I know the answer and pray that I get the right answer. I get the right answer. This is a good function, right? Now, what we'd like to do is to see, well, so for example, we said, why don't we do it for 72? So now we can do it for 72. And 68 and a half. So you've now got a prediction. For every given mid-parent height, you've got a prediction. And so why don't we put it all together into one table? And so we call heights with predictions equals heights dot with column. Um, OK, what am I going to call it? I'm going to call it prediction. And OK, now what am I going to do? How do I get all the predictions in one go? I am going to use what? Apply. apply. Terrific. So for apply, what is the first thing that I need to type? The name of the table. And the name of the table is? My old one. It was heights. OK, now what? Dot apply. And what goes first? Name of the function. Name of the function is what? Predict child. And what's the other argument? Name of the column. And what's the column that this function is going to work on? Mid-parent, exactly. OK? Ready? OK, I'm going to see what this thing looks like. Heights with predictions. OK, look, it's got to work. There's a 1,000 people. For each of those people, it is going through finding the nearest neighbors, computing the average. We've got a problem. What have we got? Ah. OK. So it's going through and it's chugging. It's chugging. That's quite a lot of work. We're not dealing with, OK, we've got that. I want to show you a picture. Heights with pre predictions dot scatter for each mid parent height we're going to plot the actual points and the predicted value you ready what have you just discovered you like galton have just discovered the regression line that is what it is it is the centers of all the vertical strips this is how it was discovered what you have done is your first pass at what is called nearest neighbor estimation. This is a fundamental concept and a fundamental method in machine learning. Because you can see, you just automated a prediction. Starting from scratch, now you can generalize this to much more uh, varied uh, context. But the same idea, you got a new point, find your old points that were near it, use some kind of average of their values as your prediction, that is what goes on in most prediction that's done in data science. All right? I will see you on, what is it, Friday.